All right, so in this, you can start to talk about what's going to happen today. All right. Um, yes, we're recording. Oh, we have we're three minutes uh, three minutes ahead still. Yeah. <laughs> but it's okay. Um, welcome, everyone. We're here now. Evelyn, Matt, today. Did you, did you, sorry. Do you do your name again? Did you? DDA. DDA. Just look at it like it would be a double D and an A at the end. Yeah, exactly. D -D -A. D -D -A. But it's, it's French, right? Yeah, second instructor. <laughs> uh, welcome, Aitan. Welcome, Bay. Martin Sanga. I mean, awesome. All right. And we are on Facebook. Perfect. In our Facebook group. Uh, it's a private Facebook group. Um, here we see there's a couple of people watching. As well, I see. Let us know if you're watching this live or on the replay. Uh, it would be great to know. Also, put any comments. Hey, Paul, great to have you watching on Facebook. Uh, Margarita is joining with Sandra as well. Awesome. So, yes, some of you who were early this more, uh, just now were able to see we had a disclaimer on. That's something new, and we're going to someone advised us to do um, because you know crypto assets and not, hashtag not financial advice so um, we feel like we are used to that in place as well who was watching listening and learning awesome great to have you here guys so welcome to the crypto talks uh, my name is Ra and Booth is um, also here there he is <laughs> <laughs> Our in house crypto expert, hey Margarita. Um, so, welcome everyone to the Crypto Vitables um, community and to the Crypto Talk on Wednesday every week. Wednesday at um, 7 p.m. Uh, Amsterdam time. So, the way this works is that we start with um, a 15 minute presentation and we follow up with a 45 minute QA. And today is a very special Crypto Talk because this is the first time we have a guest expert who's gonna share his knowledge with us. He's not here yet, but he will, he will join us. So Booth will give a brief introduction of what this is all about. And um, also, if you're here for the first time, I see Brooks, um, uh, welcome to the Crypto Vagabonds community. If you're here for the first time, you'll receive an email from us. Uh, Thank you. you can book a one-to-one -one crypto consult that we offer to everyone. This is uh, no strings attached. We should just want to help you out, see what your next steps can be in this crypto journey. So welcome, Brooks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Awesome. All right. Both, maybe you can explain a little bit um, about the crypto talk for today, which is all about quants. And look, we've got Greg coming on as well. He's already there? Yeah. Okay. So what we're going to be doing here is something which normally we only do at the Academy. We bring guest speakers. Um, of course, in the Academy is about an hour presentation and 30 minutes Q&A. But because this is a one hour uh, free crypto talk, we bring in the expert, which already came from the Academy, Greg Lunt. He's an expert on quant, QNT, um, that's a cryptocurrency. Um, and he's going to be telling you guys all about it. I met him on Clubhouse. We are part of a, a bigger team of moderators and experts in crypto on Clubhouse. There's a club called Crypto C where Greg and I are moderators there. And from the day one uh, that I met Greg, I realized I have something in common, which is uh, a profound admiration for a guy called um, Jota Peterson. And from that moment onwards, I engaged in a few calls with, uh, with Greg. And he's a very clever mind, very down to earth. I, I love the fact that he asked a lot of questions before speaking. So I brought him to the Academy. He made a wonderful presentation. And now I invite him to come to the Crypto um, Vagabonds Crypto Talk on this Wednesday. So without any further ado, uh, Greg Lunt, the floor is yours. Hey, there he is. hey, hello, hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, Booth. He looks like the president of uh, El Salvador, though, but it's not. It's Greg. <laughs> um, 
I'm just loading up this other device here because I want to play a couple of audio clips, but can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Cool. Oh, nice. um, so I see a couple of familiar faces. Um, so I will be going over some of the same stuff as last time, except we're going to do a little bit different format in that instead of about an hour presentation and then like 20 or 30 minutes of Q&A, we're going to do a 15 minute condensed presentation and then a longer Q&A at the end so we can discuss uh, the project, the space, whatever's on your mind. Um, okay, so I've got this audio queued up here. I just want to say one thing before you go ahead. Uh, we had a disclaimer here before for those who came late. Nothing that we say here it should be taken as financial or tax advice, okay? The only financial advice we give here is do your own research and be responsible for your own investment, okay? So, okay, Greg, go ahead. Yeah, that goes from me, but whatever Booth says, He's live for that. <laughs> um, okay, so let me share my screen real quick. Um, I'll share this one. Boom. Let me know if you guys can see this. Yes, all good. Excellent. Okay, so. Great. So yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth, Boof. Uh, I just wanted to tell you guys, first of all, I'm not affiliated with Quant Network. Um, nothing you hear on the stage, financial, legal, tax, accounting, investment advice. Everything is purely for educational and entertainment purposes. And the conversation will be recorded, I believe, Boof, right? So if, yes. if, you, if you miss some of it or want to revisit oh. anything, uh, go. you can do that. And, and But I would suggest taking notes if that's a, a way that you learn best because um, some of the stuff is a little bit detailed and I am going to be going pretty quickly as, as this is a very in-depth project. So to do it in 15 minutes, there's going to be skipping over a lot of stuff. And I may say a couple of things that, um, you know, you don't, it doesn't resonate with you right off the bat. So just make a note of it. You can ask in the Q and A um, and there's other materials I can point you towards if you wanted to dive deeper. <laughs> Are you going to say something Booth, before I get started? No, I just, I just gonna say, um, like, which I already say, like, I know other people here in different levels, some beginners, some are not. Take your notes, and there will be Q and A later. But I already covered that. So. Okay, great. So let me move this here. And uh, all right, so what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna talk about Quant Network. We're gonna talk about their CEO Gilbert Verdian. Uh, we're gonna talk about their product Overledger and the protocol that they're working on called ODAP. We're going to talk about the QNT token and how it works. Uh, the, some of that we're going to skim over a, a few partnerships, which is really a big meat of this is kind of the level at, at which they're being adopted behind the scenes. But we're going to kind of just skim through a bunch of the major partners. Um, briefly talk about the competition and kind of the other options for interoperability. Uh, but first, I want to just do a couple of key terms. Um, a DLT is a distributed ledger technology. It's a, basically a record of consensus that is cryptographically secured and validated by nodes. So these are protocols that enable a secure, decentralized digital database. Um, a blockchain is a type of DLT. Uh, DLT is not necessarily a blockchain. So DLT is the broader scope of distributed ledgers of which blockchain is a type. Um, interoperability, that is kind of the key term when it comes to uh, what Quant provides um, to its clients and to the space. Interoperability is the ability for different hardware and software to exchange and use information freely without any restrictions. So for example, I can use my Apple iPhone on Verizon and you can use your Samsung Galaxy with Comcast and you can talk to my laptop that has Spectrum. And we just think of it as the internet, but there's an underlying protocol that makes interoperability between these different devices possible. And that's called TCP IP. That is what we use right now on the web as we know it, uh, as the interoperability protocol. So in the 1980s, there were a lot of different independent computer networks that all had data on them, but they weren't able to speak to each other. They were kind of siloed off. And you'd have a government or a military or university that had data that was just 
constricted to its own local network. Now, once TCP IP was adopted, invented and adopted, uh, that changed everything, obviously, and allowed every, the data to move and uh, built the framework for the internet as we know it today. So we're kind of seeing blockchain doing a very similar thing in its early days where we have all these different networks that are doing their own thing and they're building their own communities and their own projects, but they're not able to speak to each other in a fast, efficient and safe way. So who is Gilbert Verdian? Gilbert Verdian is the CEO of Quant. Uh, over the last 20 years, Gilbert has been a top level cyber security executive at many major financial institutions. So we're looking just quickly at his LinkedIn here. I'm just gonna give you guys a brief overview of kind of where he's worked. Um, he has an extensive resume. I'm going to also just read you very quick the way that he tells his story uh, that he told it on Twitter. In 1997, he had a concern with the insecure architecture of the internet at its core level. The fact that there's no encryption built into the internet itself. So he decided to start a career in cybersecurity and wait for the technology to catch up so that ultimately he could fulfill his vision of building a secure internet protocol. And he says, then came the Satoshi paper in October, 2008. I saw it a couple of weeks after it was released and I loved it. Whoever Satoshi is, they understood security, decentralization and internet scale networks. I was in the UK government at the time during the financial crisis. Being at a very senior level, I asked my colleagues to assess and do a policy on Bitcoin in 2008. This made the UK government the first government to assess Bitcoin. Again, this was just weeks after the Bitcoin white paper came out. He was already bringing it to the UK government. Uh, in 2013, I moved from the UK government to the Australian government and established the blockchain ISO standard TC307 in 2015. We'll talk about that in a second. Like TCP IP, this was the right way to create a common framework for interoperable and secure blockchain networks. 61 countries are now working on this ISO standard. So basically he created, he was uh, working in healthcare in the Australian government. He built a system to move uh, sensitive healthcare data across these different networks. And ISO approached him and said, hey, can we make this a standard? And so now there's ISO TC307 which is this distributed blockchain and distributed ledger technology ISO standard. The ISO, ISO is the International Organization of Standardization. And yes, I said that right. I don't know why they flipped the words, but it is, you know, they basically have standards for everything you can think about, the size of a credit card so that the producers of the machines that you swipe it know, and like printers and paper sizes and country code names and all this stuff. It's just, there needs to be global standards for certain areas. And this is the blockchain standard. This is created by the founder of Quant. Um, and they have all these different technical committees. Um, I'm not sure why it's not showing. Oh yeah, so here are all these different committees. And you can see like there's a couple on interoperability, this one and this one, which Gilbert is the leader of um, for these two. But there's all these other ones about, um, you know, security and privacy and smart contracts and government governance. and Again, six, over 60 countries are working on this, the biggest countries in the world. Um, so I want to move on to Overledger. This is Quant's product. Oh, and by the way, just about standardization, like this is really important. Like this is how you bring mass adoption of blockchain to the world. Um, and no other, no other cryptocurrency is really like thinking about this stuff. There are some of the ISO 20,000 uh, the 20,022 you may have seen, which is like a messaging standard for banks. It's just like, okay, you need to be compliant with uh, moving money across uh, different networks using this standard. But this is a much broader reaching kind of thought process with regards to blockchain as a whole. Um, so I know I'm going fast, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep pushing here. So Overledger is Quant's product. And essentially it is, a layer two solution that lives above all of these different distributed ledger technologies. So it doesn't matter if you're a public permissionless blockchain like a Bitcoin or Ethereum. It doesn't matter if you're an enterprise private chain like Hyperledger or Porta or Quorum. And it doesn't matter anything else that you are. It can connect to Overledger via an API. And then on top of Overledger, you can build these multi-chain applications that essentially can settle across any one of these different networks 
and build a single smart contract that taps into all any and all of these different networks and run them on over Ledger in a secure and scalable way. So I'm going to play you a quick clip of Gilbert talking about Overledger and kind of the value proposition that it brings to enterprises in particular. I like the idea of DAPs, the decentralized applications. So what we wanted to do was take that concept and make it multi-DLT. So think of a payment application or an existing DAP that the people are using in DeFi to wrap it with Overledger. So you upgrade the capabilities of that DAP and you natively make it multi-DLT. You're able to have that DAP exist on Ethereum, on Ripple, on Bitcoin, on EOS, and also be linked to a quarter DLT that a bank is using internally. So we're bridging the permission permissionless world very easily. And if you take an existing financial institution that has millions of users, billions of dollars and pounds, Without Overledger, they would have to go post nodes, they would have to create specific networks, different data center segments, and get custom stuff built just to be able to talk blockchain. So it's hugely complex and it takes, you know, minimum eight months from our experience just to get a blockchain project up and running. And minimum, it's going to cost a, a couple of million pounds. And then if you want to use more than one blockchain, then you have to repeat that same process for all your applications and all your systems. Just connect to our API and you can say, I want to use blockchain more and all it's going to take is three lines of code. Stripe is a very good example that the payments infrastructure was hugely complex to run. And then Stripe came in and said, all you need to do is add five lines of code and you could use the Stripe API and then you can do payments. So we've taken a similar approach where we've just simplified the adoption for enterprise to use blockchain. Okay, so basically it's just an API that you can plug into your existing network and you can get access as an enterprise to the blockchain space, or you can build your own multi-ledger blockchain smart contracts and build out these different programs and applications that can integrate easily with your system. So uh, we'll touch on the competitors a little bit later, um, but this is a different approach and it's a more safer, scalable enterprise grade approach. Um, and this comes from Gilbert's background in cybersecurity for high level governments and high level central banks and enterprises. He understands how that works and what they're looking for. Um, Overledger allows you to build these contracts in 12 different traditional coding languages as well. So you're not tap, you're not tied into um, like Solidity or some of these blockchain specific languages. There's only a couple hundred thousand blockchain developers in the world, but there's 27 million traditional developers. So this opens the door for uh, the average developer to start learning how to build blockchain. And as of yesterday, actually, Quant launched uh, a course uh, in conjunction with King's College London and hosted on futurelearn.com called A Beginner's Guide to Becoming a Blockchain Developer with Overledger, which is an online certification course where users can learn how to write these multi-chain applications in any coding language and have it run seamlessly across different blockchains. And they'll also receive that certificate from Quant and from King's College after the course, and it's free. So this is a huge step in terms of onboarding developers and teaching them how to start using this technology. Um, you can do things like build smart contracts for Bitcoin, which you can't do right now. Um, you can do any, you can really just have like a lot more flexible approach to building in the space. Um, Quant has patents on Overledger, uh, on this multi, um, multi blockchain ledger, essentially, this is a single ledger in which all the transactions from all these different chains live on a, a single ordering and filtering layer. They have a patent on that. And they're also in the process of patenting what they're calling multi ledger tokens, which essentially are tokens that can live on any blockchain at once. And however they're spent and used in those ecosystems, it'll automatically settle back on the source chain and have an auditable record maintained. Um, so this is game changing stuff, really. Like it's still yet to see how these use cases play out and what the killer applications are. But um, this is definitely the foundation for a different way and a different, more flexible, scalable way to use blockchain. So trucking along here, um, I wanna, touch briefly on ODAP, which is a protocol that Quant is building. It's even bigger than Overledger. So if you think about TCP IP, this is the interoperability and open standardized protocol that runs the internet as we know it. 
as we move to distributed ledgers, we are going to need an upgraded Web3 protocol to allow all digital assets to transfer um, that is open and standardized. And that is what they are working on called ODAP. And I'll just play you really quickly, Gilbert, uh, his origin story with ODAP uh, and how this came about. I've always had an idea of creating an internet protocol for money. Coincidentally, I've been thinking about it and I spoke at an event and one of the MIT people spoke at the same event. I just realized he gets it and MIT understand where this is all heading. And I approached them, I said, look, I've got this idea. We need to create a protocol that can allow the seamless move of digital assets between different networks and different gateways, an open digital asset protocol that anyone can implement and use. And they agreed. So we've got the US government's involved, the Internet Engineering Task Force, they're the ones that endorsed and enabled TCP IP to happen. They're the ones that basically created the protocols that run the internet. There's the likes of Juniper and Intel part of it. We've got payment companies interested in it. We've got telecoms companies interested in it. So it's it started to be a big thing. And what we're looking to do is to create that internet scale protocol to move digital assets and at the core level, how does that one network have a gateway to understand and find resources to another network. And so that's what we're tackling, which is much larger. So if you can think of ODAP as TCP IP is the protocol that will connect all these different distributed ledgers and blockchains and Web3, as we want to call it, um, we're essentially upgrading the internet itself. That is the revolution that we're going through. Um, and it provides a ton of benefits, but that's really what's happening, right? Is we're taking this internet of information where we can send pictures and text and video and very seamlessly transfer information anywhere on the globe and in one click, but there's no security that's built into the protocol that moves these, this information. So we're upgrading from the internet of information to the internet of value, the internet of trust. And there needs to be a cryptographically, similar in 1997 when Gilbert that was his initial goal was he was concerned that the internet did not have encryption built into the underlying protocols. That is what ODAP intends to do. This is a collaboration between Quant and MIT originally. Like he said, they've, they've included the US government, Intel, Juniper, other massive corporations. And this has been now cited in Visa's interoperability report, um, Hyperledger. Uh, there's a number of massive companies that are citing this work. Um, and it should be done within a couple of years, it looks like, but they're working through the Internet Engineering Task Force, which are the people that also put forth TCP IP. So ODAP is the protocol by which digital assets will move around the Internet. Overledger is Quant's product that will provide an API gateway. ODAP works on gateways. See all these GWs, these gateways? This is how you will connect to the infrastructure. Quant Silverledger is. Did my computer just skip? Am I still good? Can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yep. Yep. Wow, yes, my computer's can. like kind of spazzing out here. What's oh, yeah, your screen on? is black now. My yeah, oh, there we go. Flickering. This is very strange. Your screen's back. Your screen's back. Yeah, but not for me. Yeah. Never had this happen before. Okay, well, well, you take some time to sort out the Give screen. Me. I just want to welcome the new people that arrived. And I just want to, uh, everyone who is new to crypto, normally we um, do like crypto basics uh, presentations. Ra, sorry. Sorry. I want to mute myself. Use our microphone because it's breaking up. Sorry, which one am I using? Yeah, okay, sorry. All right, I know I just wanted to say, um, so if you're new and all of this information is flying over your head, uh, normally we have like more basic subjects that we cover. And you know, after this short presentation, we have a Q&A, so you can ask any questions. You can also ask questions around other subjects, not necessarily related to quant, but also crypto basics and beginners things. So um, don't, uh, we, we don't want to scare anyone who's new to crypto. So, you know, this is this is quite advanced um, for most people. So, um, yeah, just uh, anyway, just wanted to say that. Feel free to ask me questions later on. All right. I hope in the meantime. Zach is getting back. 
I'm so sorry about this. I don't know why, but my computer's like flickering uh, when I share my screen. So let me try one more time. Or otherwise we might have to go without the shared screen, but. You can send me the links on a shared screen, uh, Greg. Okay, every time I share my screen, I'm getting some weird error, man. Um, I would have to restart and I don't want to take five minutes, but. Um, Give me the link and I share the screen. So there's like a bunch of links. I have like 10 more links to go through as far as visuals go. Um, they're not super important. They're just kind of backing up what I'm saying. Um, so you may just have to look at me, unfortunately. Um, okay, let me, let me keep this moving along because I don't want to fall too far behind. But we were talking about ODAP is the protocol. Overledger provides gateways onto the protocol. Okay. There will be other gateway providers over time. What, what Overledger has going for it is that it allows for multi-chain contracts, that patent that they have to actually connect different networks and build multi-chain smart contracts. That's patented. So while other people will be able to connect to the network, of course, uh, because it is open and it must be used to move digital assets, the, uh, the way to build multi-chain smart contracts is patented. So that is, that's huge. And uh, the QNT token is part of Overledger. It runs Overledger. Um, and so really quickly, the QNT token, there's a 14.6 million supply of QNT with a hard cap. 100% uh, of these tokens were minted during an ICO in 2018, uh, were allocated approximately 70% to the public, and then 30% to uh, the company reserve in terms of well, I guess it's 18% company reserve, 14% to the founders. Uh, we're now down from that 18%. It's closer to, it's like low single digits now because that has been used for like research and development, um, overhead and legal infrastructure, marketing, engineering, et cetera. So we're up to about 75 or 80% of the tokens in supply are with the public. So that's great. And everything has already been minted. So this is not, there's no inflation on this token. So um, if you understand the value proposition of let's say Bitcoin, with regards to its scarcity, you have that exact same thing here with Quant. Um, QNT tokens are used in a few different ways. The biggest one is gonna be licensing fees. So in order to use Overledger, companies need to uh, buy a licensing fee, a license that is then locked up for a year. Um, and those tokens get taken off the market. And then they're also used uh, to run these gateways. So in order to, to have a gateway, um, you can just spin it up on your own and then you stake your QNT to the gateway and you become basically a node in the network that then helps transact some of the volume and you're rewarded for those transactions. So there's real yield based on the QNT that's passing through your gateway. It's not some inflationary yield like some of these DeFi protocols where they just print whatever they want out of thin air forever and they can give you these crazy yields. This will actually be real yield. Uh, based on a network of networks that spans very far. And I want to talk about just very briefly some of these uh, partnerships that they have. So there are what Overledger is a white label product. That's important because um, they essentially can li they license out their technology, Quant does, uh, without necessarily having to obtain credit for that. So part of their value proposition as a white label B2B company is that they can say, use our technology, pay us a licensing fee, and you can actually take credit for the technology as your own. You can say, we've built an API interoperability protocol for you to do this, this, and this within our business. Um, and they don't have to say that it's from Quant. So having said that, we don't know 95% of their partnerships because they're all under NDA. However, we do know a lot of their public ones which are, for example, LACChain. This is the Latin American Caribbean chain. It's a global alliance that reaches 15 Latin American and Caribbean countries, and they are launching the first public permissioned distributed ledger network in the world. Um, we could dive into kind of what that is, but basically just know that it's like an open, legal governed system, same way like public education and public roads uh, and public health. This is like a public blockchain uh, in that anyone can really use it, but you still have to like show some ID in order to access those 
uh, this uh, utility. Um, this is the largest global network in the world. Quan is providing, or the, the, the largest DLN in the world um, as of now, and Quant is distributing uh, interoperability for that protocol, as well as creating the Latin American dollar. So they are building the Latin American dollar with their multi-ledger token technology. We talked about these tokens that can live on multiple chains. Uh, Oracle it's the second largest software company in the world, has certified Overledger as their interoperability solution for their blockchain and cloud platform, and is now working in a highly collaborative manner with Quant to roll out solutions to their 480,000 clients that use their cloud infrastructure. Um, SIA, SIA, is a banking conglomerate in Europe and the Middle East and Oceania. Uh, and in collaboration, they, they've now partnered with Nexi Group, and together that is they are now the largest fintech provider in all of Europe. And they connect over a thousand banks and financial institutions, including over twenty central banks. Quant is SIA's interoperability solution. I can't. I would show you guys these links. Um, there are press releases from both Oracle and SIA, basically saying. Um, Quant has successfully test. We've successfully tested interoperability with Quant Network, and these are a couple of is years it, old at this point. Is it this one, Greg? This link? Can you see it? Um, can you see my screen still? The no. screen is black. No, I'm, 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 I found a list of links. Oh, in the chat. Can you and uh, can you see my screen? No, your screen is black, sweetie. Oh. Okay, that's strange because I was sharing. Uh, look. Um, Let me try sharing myself here. I'm trying one more time. Just to oh, yeah, see there. It. Right? So this there. one? Whoever sharing is, yeah. 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 I'm trying to share one more time. Let's see if this holds up. But is that already great? Okay. Can you see it? Oh, yeah. So this is Overledge. Uh, this is Oracle talking about it. Um, you can also, if you Googled SIA quant, um, so th this is a little, if you scroll down, yeah, overledger in action, and it basically talks about, oh, you can keep going, maybe. Keep going. Uh, it's, it's in this blog post for sure. It says how, how they're working together and they've been certified. It's not as clear, unfortunately, but. Mm, okay. Um, oh, okay, maybe this doesn't work. Okay. Um, no, that's it's great. Though. Thank you for that. Um, so SIA and Nexi Group, again, 1,000 banks and 20 central banks in Europe, and they are certified with Overledger as well. Hyperledger is, uh, they have 17 different deployments for enterprise blockchain, including Hyperledger Fabric, which is the most widely adopted enterprise blockchain solution in the world. Um, they, uh, Quan is part of their foundation and has been featured across a number of their publications. Um, part of the Digital Pound Foundation in the UK, uh, Quant is a member of the Digital Pound Foundation helping uh, lend their technology to the building of the Digital Pound. And the Digital Pound Foundation as of this week has also joined the Digital Euro Association. So Quant is tied to the Digital Euro through SIA and Nexi Group partnership, and also now through their association with the Digital Pound Foundation. Um, AU Cloud is Australia's cloud computing infrastructure for government and defense department and supply chain and critical national infrastructure in Australia. Quant is their solution for interoperability. Again, this is public. AU Cloud, you can Google that. Um, SDX is the Swiss Digital Exchange. It's a, um, a new age version of SIX, which is the basically the Swiss uh, stock exchange. Um, they were the first ever internet exchange the, and the first ever online exchange, uh, fully digital or fully electronic exchange, I should say. Um, they're now building Swiss Digital Exchange, which is the first fully regulated digital asset exchange. Um, and they're doing all these cross-border payments with big banks and all this type of stuff. And Quant is their solution for interoperability. Um, they're also, as we mentioned, working with MIT on ODAP, but MIT's digital currency initiative, a smaller part of MIT, is working on the digital dollar. And they're commissioned by the Boston Fed to build the digital USD. And so um, 
Quan and MIT have put out a joint white paper called Implementing a CBDC. And they basically talk about Quant's multi-ledger multi token technology as the solution for building a CBDC and why it solves all the challenges. So if you just put two and two together, MIT is building, the, is building a CBDC for the US and they're also putting out a white paper with Quant saying, if we were to build a CBDC, this is how we do it using Quant. So um, it's pretty obvious that Quant is building digital dollar. Um, that will be confirmed within the next uh, six to 18 months. Um, based on the timeline that they put forth, what's called Project Hamilton, that's the digital dollar report. Um, Gemini has confirmed that Quant is using, that, that sorry, the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, is using Quant's multi-ledger token technology. Uh, we had speculated that that's the case, but once Gemini listed them, they put out like an article about Quant and then they kind of just said it in the blog post. Um, they've also been highlighted by KPMG and Deloitte and Gartner for their innovations. So that's a quick run through of some of the public partnerships and, and uh, kind of people that have highlighted Quant. Uh, and then the last thing I wanna talk about is competition. So um, basically what we see right now is a lot of these cross authentication bridges that allow you to do like token minting and kind of wrapped Ethereum and like you lock stuff up in one contract and then it mints it on another one and you have this third, sorry about that. We have this third party that's kind of holding your tokens and these create like massive security vulnerabilities. We've seen uh, just a couple of days ago, we saw the wormhole hack. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Um, we saw Polychain get hacked or Poly Network get hacked a few months ago for like 600 million. We've seen ThorChain and the Rune token get hacked multiple times within a couple of weeks last year. All of these cross-chain authentication bridges and stuff, they, they're, they take a lot more overhead in terms of, um, they're basically blockchains that live on top of blockchains. And this creates overhead complexities. You have to account for different consensus mechanisms. They're one-off, one-for-one kind of bridges, and they have security vulnerabilities. Um, what Quan is doing is building an API gateway uh, where APIs create a lot more resiliency and scalability opportunity and they're enterprise grade and uh, Quant's specific solution has been tested by all these major institutions that I've been talking about uh, and they're globally standardized through ISO TC 307. So this is not like little companies like, hey, we've built a bridge from blockchain A to blockchain B, like use us. It's more like we have universal interoperability through APIs that's certified by enterprise and government. It's a whole different level. Um, um, so in conclusion, uh, Quant Network has, a devel has developed a technology called Overledger, which is an overlay software application that lives above DLTs, irrespective of design. Um, their CEO has a 20-year history in top-level cybersecurity positions across government and central banks and have been focused on creating a cryptographically secure internet for, uh, since the late 1990s. This is a long-standing vision for him. Uh, and his technology, this technology is patented. It's universal, and they're leading different standards bodies around the world, cementing themselves as a major player in the future of finance. Their public That's partnerships touch every end of the globe and are, in my opinion, orders of magnitude larger than what these other crypto projects are doing at the moment. Uh, as we talked about, 14.6 million tokens, uh, diamond handed ad early adopters, uh, waiting on the release of these gateways, which are going to lock up a ton of supply and create a supply shock in the coming months and years as utility starts to escalate. Um, so my favorite thing about this is that if you believe in Quan as an interoperability solution, you don't have to pick anymore, like your winning favorite project of like solving little use cases, because whatever it is, Quan's gonna connect all of it. Um, and so at a sub $2 billion market cap, uh, I think Quan is one of the strongest fundamental crypto buys that there are right now not financial advice and that's it sorry i ran a little bit long booth and for the <laughs> it's okay that's that's what i got for you uh, thank you so much greg and also to have it so condensed because i know it's a huge project so i, I just have a question for everyone who understood what he spoke about raise their hand I did. <laughs> I did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's good. Um, we have different levels of, of people here. 
So if you don't understand, just let us know what you don't understand. Ask the question, Greg's gonna be able to answer you. And if he's not able to, to explain to you in a language that makes sense to you, I will speak the explaining to grammar language. That's what I'm known for. So you guys may should uh, raise your hand. I see Musonda. If you wanna raise your hand and ask a question, uh, go for it. I don't know if Musonda is raising the hand because he understood or didn't understand or wants to ask a question. Musonda, do you have a question? Uh, Martin, have a question? Uh, yeah, yeah, I actually do have a question. That was a perfect presentation. So I understand the use case for it, which is fantastic, as well as the partnerships that they're actually making. However, like, for example, what's the benefit if I specifically, as an individual called Quant? That's uh, one of my questions. And the second one is um, in terms of uh let's say if you wanted to write a smart contract on bitcoin that's a problem but do you have to understand how bitcoin operates but if you fully understand quant can you just write a smart contract for bitcoin on quant that's what i wanted to find out yeah so good question so the qnt token uh as a holder you're basically looking at um tons of enterprises coming in and uh basically they pay their licensing fee in fiat and then that gets converted to the QNT token and locked in a smart contract for the duration of the license. So these are yearly contracts where everyone that gets onboarded locks up the QNT token and creates uh, less and less supply on the market combined with all the different gateway operators that will be locking up their QNT. So we're basically just looking at an extremely scarce asset that's being adopted at an alarming rate. And if you just think about general supply and demand principles in terms of lower, lower decreasing supply at, while there's increasing adoption. That's how it's built, right? As more and more people come on the network, more and more tokens get locked up. And so you have more demand, less supply. And if people want to create these multi-ledger contracts independently or small business or enterprise, they need to also use the QNT token to access the system, to run their networks and to create um, you know these 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 ecosystems and these projects and these applications. Um, so the QNT has a ton of utility value. Um, not to mention, of course, there will always be the speculative aspect. Once people understand what's going on here and they see that Quant is connecting uh, everything, um, it's really kind of mind blowing. And so there will be a speculative element to it. But what's beautiful about QNT is that it's actually a true utility token in terms of securing this network and providing um transaction value as well as this licensing and gateway lockups so decreasing supply increasing demand is kind of my answer um and as far as the bitcoin smart contracts uh yes the beauty of overledger is that you can come in and whatever connector frameworks are already in place in their system bitcoin is one of them among a number of others and there's more being added um there's no reason why every single blockchain or distributed ledger or legacy infrastructure cannot be connected to Overledger. Um, Bitcoin is one of them that's already connected and you can come in and build a smart contract in any traditional language, mind you. So JavaScript or Python or Ruby or C or whatever you code in. And you can build a smart contract that pulls and that does read and writes to Bitcoin and you can leave it on just that or and connects to like your other systems to so say you already have like some sort of infrastructure and you want to integrate Bitcoin. You can do that. You can build a Bitcoin exclusive smart contract or you can connect like multiple blockchains. So if, you know, someone pays me in this, I want to convert it to Bitcoin and then I want to use that to buy an NFT on Solana that it's going to like show up in this metaverse on Ethereum. Like you can do stuff like that. Um, there's really no limits to the creativity. So um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Now I see Martin and Sandra raise their hand as well. Go for it, guys. Yeah, uh, I'm kind of confused because to talk about Overledger is a blockchain for Quant, but I thought Quant was on the Ethereum blockchain, or I'm mistaken. Yeah, so Quant is not a blockchain. Quant is an API gateway. Um, it's an it's more of an operating system. Okay. So, so sorry, Greg. Yes. Sorry, I, I think it's important maybe to explain what is AP, API, application uh... programming interface. So it's basically just a way 
to connect different systems very easily. Um, it's just like a kind of a plug and play, like you just put in a short line of code and then behind that code is where all the complexity is. But for the user side, it's just a simple three lines of code and you're now plugged into the system. So they use APIs for resiliency and security and scalability as opposed to like some of those cross chain bridges I was talking about where you have to build out like these really complex uh, overhead like blockchain to blockchain infrastructures and they're one to one. This is more universal. Um, so Overledger uh, Quant is not a blockchain. It's an it's a gateway or a operating system that other blockchains can all communicate within. And the QNT token, to your point, is an ERC20 token right now. The reason they chose to do their ICO on Ethereum was because Ethereum is the most popular blockchain uh, uh, as in terms of being able to mint tokens. Uh, all the exchanges already have all the infrastructure to support Ethereum uh, is the most widely adopted. But because of Quant's multi-ledger token technology, the QNT token can be used on any blockchain. Um, and they're not tied to Ethereum in any way. It was just chosen out of utility and practicality based on Ethereum's adoption. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Now we get it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Magnus, go for it, brother. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the QNT token is limited. Is it limited for now or forever? And, and what is stopping them from sort of double or tripling the, the amount of tokens? Yeah, um, so it's limited. As far as we know, it's forever. I mean, I suppose in theory, any protocol could just, I mean, look at what Ethereum's doing right now. They're moving from proof of work to proof of stake. They used to be, uh, you know, unlimited cap and now they're deflationary. So like, and this is a decentralized quote unquote um, kind of uh, governance system. So could they change the cap of QNT? I think anything's possible in theory, um, but you're never, in my opinion, Bitcoin is really the only decentralized protocol that basically like is 99% or uh, decentralized. Uh, everything else has centralization concerns of one way or another. Quant is a company. The way I like to think of this is less about like, it's less emotional about um, an utopian around decentralization and Web3. And like, it's more about, these are all softwares that are coming out. These are all brand new softwares. We're investing in which software we think is going to take over and get the biggest market share for their use cases. And in this case, um, there's a company that builds and runs this software. There will be lots of decentralization elements to it. There are some places that they are centralized, one of which is how the token works. Currently, the token is integral to the system. Uh, they didn't sell out on their ICO. So there were actually like 45 million tokens. And since they didn't sell out, they actually burned all of them down to 14.6. This is calculated, I th they, um, but to your point, I think any anything's possible. There is always gonna be some trust involved investing in projects, mm -hmm. investing in companies that they're gonna do what they say they're gonna do. So there's no guarantees, but uh, so far, Gilbert has been a man of his word and he's come through on every single promise that he's made to the community. Um, they're extremely professional. Everything's regulated and standardized. So to overhaul the entire system in order to mint tokens, um, just to di dilute holders and dilute gateways, I think would be a huge problem for them. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's no guarantees, I suppose. Okay, let me just say if I understand what we're saying. We are saying like the game theory says that it's very improbable, but of course the possibility is always there. Is, is that a, a, good, uh, a way to say it, Greg? Yep, that's exactly right. Okay. Is that it's, not you? it's not something I'm concerned about just because we're dealing with like an individual with a, with a track record and a reputation versus like some random developers that are anonymous. Yeah, did I answer you, uh, Magnus? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, good question. Brooks, good question. Brooks, go for it, brother. Uh, hey, all. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, I 
thought this would be a bigger group. I didn't know that it would be recognizable that I wasn't part of it before. But uh, Greg, thanks so much. Uh, super interesting stuff. Um, I, I don't have a question, more of a comment. Um, this is one. Of, this is the first kind of group um, thing I've, I've done. Um, I'm absolutely obsessed with crypto, but tra day trading it for about a year and a half. Um, been in the real estate industry for 10 years and just breaking out. And I know zero people in crypto and it is impossible to get in. Um, I, you know, I don't want to be a burden. I'm going to toss my email address in the, in the chat. Even if you just want to shoot the shit and talk crypto, my girlfriend freaking hates when I do it because I do it all the time. <laughs> so I'd love to, you know, just talk about it and, and, uh, <laughs> And uh, just, you know, anybody who's interested in the, in the subject. So appreciate your um, time. Sorry. Perfect. Go ahead. Oh, Brooks, it's really, really <laughs> awesome that you found us because that's exactly what this community is about. So we have this Facebook group. We meet up every week um, on this Zoom room, this, this same link, same time. Uh, but Booth also hosts Clubhouse rooms. Um, so this is, is you know, especially uh, just to talk, hang out and talk about crypto because indeed not everyone speaks this language. So it's <laughs> perfect, perfect yeah. To, yeah. to have you here. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Glad to be here. <laughs> awesome. Matt, I think that's uh, your turn now, brother. Oh, yeah. Um... I'm completely new to this. Uh, thanks, Greg. Um, I'm just trying to make sense of something in my head. So don't, if I'm miles off, then don't waste your time trying to correct me because I've got loads to learn. But is what you're saying that uh, effectively all the blockchains, obviously, like, uh, they speak a completely different language to each other. And then is Quaint kind of acting as the translator, the like universal translator, which brings all these different languages in together and translates it into a universal language. Is that the kind of thing? That yeah, that, that's exactly right. So you have all these networks, like you said, that speak their own language. They have their own consensus mechanisms to, you know, have the transactions go through and how they work. And currently the solution is basically like taking one blockchain and taking another blockchain and then building like a complex framework that accounts for both of the consensus mechanisms. And th this is very complicated. It's very, uh, it's a very arduous process. It's expensive and takes time. Uh, and it's shown to have security vulnerabilities. You're still trusting the person who's building the bridge to lock up your assets in that bridge in order to communicate. Uh, what Quan has done is they're building connector frameworks of their own for you that then tie into their API, um, which provides additional resiliency. Uh, and these, this gateway model is being standardized on a global level such that the overledger ecosystem, you can now come in and instead of worrying about these one-to-one -one solutions, these little bridges, you now have universal interoperability and not just between blockchains, but also to legacy financial systems as well, which is um, something that most of these uh, blockchain interoperability protocols cannot support is kind of like non blockchains and like it, you know, existing financial infrastructure, which are not going to overhaul their entire system overnight and go to blockchain and DLT. They're going to integrate this slowly. They're going to use it. You know, they need to be able to speak both languages at the same time. And so Quant provides this enterprise grade solution um, for interoperability for blockchain and for legacy. Cool. You're right on track, Matt. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to say something before somebody else. Um, Brooks, um, just one thing that I want to make sure that everyone here understands in the, in the group. Sure. We have a basic rule on the group, which is no one suggests to any member of the group giving up custody. You are very strong defenders of you hold your crypto. I know uh, you do, do day trading. Day trading, you have to give up cost of your yep. assets to your platform. So if you want to interact with our group, fine. But no one in the group may suggest to another member of the group giving up cost yes. of your assets. Yes. That's all I want to yeah, I, 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 I absolutely understand that, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the rule is for everyone. It's not just for you. It's for everyone in the group. <laughs> just, <laughs> just me. Yeah. No, I understand. But thanks for mentioning that. Appreciate it.
we can check in uh, because I know there's a few new people as well. Maybe you can mute yourself. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we're in the same room, so it's a bit like we have to manage the microphone. <laughs> but um, um, I just want to check in with another and a few new members that are here tonight to see if you have any questions. Brian is here, I know. Um, and also Solomon. Hi, Ryan. Uh, I thought, well, I may, I may as well come off as you keep mentioning me. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, I suppose, a question from my point of view. So, I, I, I tried to keep up with what was being said, but if I'm honest, I'm totally lost. But um, I would be interested in just, and, and this is a basic question, I suspect, for some of the guys in the call. Can you explain what a blockchain is? So, we've said that, you know, DLT is not, uh, is, is, is a type of blockchain um, and quant isn't a blockchain. So just for the, the, the stupid question uh, that I'll ask is what's a blockchain? Perfect, yeah, this is a perfect question. Move is gonna answer it for you. Um, hold on. Uh, next week, we actually have uh, uh, the blockchain basics as the subject for the crypto talks. So I just want to mention that, but Booth is also going to expand a little bit now. Okay, and, and the reason I want to get this... Uh, I didn't know that, so that's a great prompt. Yeah. And, and the reason why I'm taking this answer is because I can speak like a grammar 10-year-old language. I can, I'm going to explain to you in a very basic language, and then Greg can add on a more technical side. So a blockchain, the best way for you to understand what a blockchain is, is to first, Brian, understand what is a ledger or an accounted uh, books, right, of transactions. So let's say <clears throat> you are an accountant uh, and you have, you're responsible for some finance of different clients and you put on, on your book, client X owe me 200, client Y paid. So you have that ledger of transactions and like updating who owes money to who. That's uh, the role of a blockchain. So it's a, one block would be one page of that ledger, one page of that transactions uh, written on a, on, a piece, on a page. The reason why it's called blockchain is because we use cryptography and mathematics to link each page to one another. So instead of writing on a piece of paper, you are writing that on a hardware code, the same way your bank has a ledger of your bank account. And the way to prevent uh, mutation or alteration on that ledger, what happened is we use mathematical cryptography to make sure that if anything, I space one number or one letter goes capital case or lowercase, everything changes on, on, on the verification code of that page. So basically you do something in cryptography called hash where you get one code for the entire input and that code goes from the bottom of one page to the top of the other one. Meaning that that page is a sequence of the previous one because the number here is on top and then another number goes on the bottom and that number that goes on the bottom goes on the top of the other one as well. So you have a mathematical cryptography way to ensure like total, um, total immunity to, to mutation. You cannot alter anything on any page. So that's why it's called blockchain because it's a sequence of pages of a ledger. They are all locked by cryptography code that makes it impossible for you to alter any detail on the transaction page. That's basically a way that I can explain. Does it make sense to you? Yeah, it does. Yeah, sorry, I did lose you for a bit, and it could be my. I'm in a hotel at the moment, so I may have lost the. It might could be the internet. So I'm I'm having Greg's problem, I think, right now. But yeah, I think I got that. That so basically, it's a security system that's built around a mathematical formulation which links page to page, so it gives a. Um, how can I put it? Um, Immutability. Yeah. So in other words, you can't alter that. So it's, 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 uh, yeah. Okay. I think I understand that. Yeah. So, so basically a blockchain is just a series of pages, which, which is, uh, and each page is a ledger. Yes. Each page is a ledger of transactions. So, so that is the is best there, way. Is there a limit to the number of pages? Is there multiple blockchains or is it just one single blockchain with millions of pages? Okay. So in, in the case of the Bitcoin network, each page is, it occurs in on average every 10 minutes. And okay. it's about seven transactions per second. On the Ethereum case, one page occurs every 15 seconds. But the pages will continue being added forever as long as the blockchain is alive. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. In the case of Solana, it's 1.23 is 1 pages per second. 
So, so like, so it's 2.3 pages per second. So in the case of Solana, you have more than two pages per second. In the case of the Bitcoin blockchain, you have one page every 10 minutes on average. In the case of Ethereum, it's one page every 15 seconds. So each blockchain decides when they're going to close the page and when they're going to open a new one. Okay. And, you, and sorry, again, I, I could be asking no problem. you know, 100 questions here. I'll ask you one more. Just on that ledger, you're saying each line is a, it's like, you know, so and so, uh, su such a person, X mm. amount. Is, is that what we, is that what's, is that a crypto currency? That, is that your, so on that line, is that what becomes a cryptocurrency that you own? Is that, is, am I okay. talking something completely different? So the cryptocurrency is the value, the unit of value on that blockchain, right? Yeah. And I use the example of people, but in truth, there is no identity to any account. Mm -hmm. Basically, an account on the Bitcoin blockchain would be a sequence of letters and numbers between yeah. 30 to 38 different digits. And when you have that sequence of numbers, that sequence of number have a certain balance of the available unit of uh, account mm -hmm. or unit of value on that blockchain. So in the case of the Bitcoin network, there will be maximum 21 million. In the case of Quant, there is, I think, 14 point something million. In the case of Ethereum, it was growing. Now it's shrinking. So mm -hmm. in the case of Cardano, I think it's 46 uh, billion. So it depends on how many units each blockchain decide that you have. And then the fraction of those available token would be delegated to different names. What is beautiful is that every time the page gets closed, there is an audit of the balance so we cannot counterfeit an actual token so we always know how many are in circulation and where each fraction is on which account each fraction is does that answer you yeah 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 i think so yeah yeah makes sense yeah i, I think i can grasp that it's probably it's generated a lot more questions but i'll ask those another day <laughs> one step at a time <laughs> okay thank you thank you you're welcome Aiton. Uh, yes, there's just one minute left. It's a perfect timing. Greg, uh, thank you. It was completely just mind. Yeah, you get it. It would be awesome if you can come back to Wolf and Ra's Academy and just dig deeper into this because that was just like you peel back a whole layer that I didn't know existed. I'm sure I'm not alone, but it would be awesome. Buff, you can hear me, right? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Craig. It is awesome. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you, Eric. Um, yeah. yeah, it was definitely a challenge to kind of, and I didn't fit it into the 15 minutes. <laughs> and I, I tried, <laughs> um, and I still couldn't do it. Um, very, that's, I felt the same way. Like, it, it totally was like, well, this is different than all this other stuff. Like, this is, it made it, it made blockchain a lot more real. It's like, oh, the people that they're working with and the way that this is constructed is just, it's not like some DeFi chain that is like giving 10,000% APY. Oh, this is the next big thing. It's more like this is connecting all ecosystems in a actual like regulated way. Um, and that kind of blew my mind a little bit. So I do have other content on it. I'm always happy to come and support Boof and, and, and Ra in this, uh, this community. Um, but I guess we're, I don't know when we're going to wrap up in a few minutes, but I'll just I'll let you know kind of where you can find some other content if you want to do some digging on your own in the meantime. Yeah, no, we're definitely going to bring you back. But I also saw Solomon Sakala raise his hand before and then he put it down. So I'm going to give the question to him and then I'll go to Lawrence. Solomon, go for it, brother. Okay, hi, everyone. Hi. Um, okay, just a quick one. Um, so from what I'm getting, um, what's basically being said is uh, quant is bridging the token-based systems uh, with the already legacy existing banking system and basically centralizing. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's that's the idea I'm getting behind uh, uh, quant, seeing um, mostly what we're talking about here is uh, token based um is, is token based so i guess it depends i think there's different levels of centralization um and i think this is a whole conversation into it unto itself but uh yes essentially they have built a software solution um 
the the ui for being able to build these smart contracts is i guess you could say centralized in that they build out this ui and they um, are running um, this software but the gateways by which the information is flowing through will be increasingly more and more decentralized over time as people stake their own gateways um, and the information runs more in a decentralized manner. So Quan is not overseeing like the transactions that are taking place. They're not um, any sort of filtration process for that. That's still going to be permissionless in that way. Um, however, they do have a central uh, software system that you would be using to get all the benefits of building these multi-chain smart contracts and being able to bridge these tokens and have these different blockchains speak to each other. I just want to add something to what you said, Greg. Uh, Solomon, even DeFi we call decentralized finance, it is not decentralized. Um, we, we have this illusion that we live in a decentralized world once we're in crypto. There's a lot of centralization in crypto still. Um, so I, I just want to let people know that it's not because it's called decentralized finance, it means it's decentralized. It is more a misnomer and the right name would be self-enforced finance or self-enforced contract. Uh, that's what I want to say. There was uh, Lawrence also had his hand up. Go for it, Lawrence. Hello, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, and thanks, Greg, for your presentation. Sorry, I think it was in and out. I couldn't catch it all, but I've seen you on um, Clubhouse as well. I was just curious, uh, and this could be open to to Booth as well, but just because um, there's different projects working on the connectivity of blockchains. So I'm just just curious how you feel about this compares to like the other ones that are doing it in a, in a different way. Yeah. Hey, what's up, Lawrence? Nice king you got back there. Um, so. Yeah, so we talked a little bit about this, right? So there's three types of interoperability. There's cross authentication, there's oracles, and then there's API gateways. Uh, cross authentication is basically these bridges that we that we talk about, where it's like a blockchain on top of a blockchain, a bit like a Cosmos or a Polkadot that is like uh, it needs to build these one-off bridges that account for the different consensus mechanisms and provides a lot of overhead and potential security risk. Or what it does is it just builds kind of like a bigger island. So let's assume that there are no security risks in, you know, Cosmos or Polkadot, um, that you still need to connect. Like they work differently, but they're just creating bigger islands. Um, all these all these networks are, are islands of data. These are just creating bigger islands. But the Cosmos network still needs to talk to the Polkadot network, still needs to talk to Bitcoin, still needs to talk to Chase Bank and central banks and CBDCs. And um, you need a universal interoperability solution for that. Um, oracles are, are basically like a nuanced uh, version of interoperability where they just provide like data feeds, offline and online data feeds kind of go in and out of these oracles. And there's what's called the Oracle problem, which is like, well, how do you decide who the trusted party is to move that online data and offline? That's what Chainlink is going after. Um, and then you have the gateway system, which is basically what uh, Quant is working under, which provides additional resiliency through APIs. Um, and you're not exposed to, uh, from a security perspective, all the complexities up front. It's like a one time on the back end and it can connect anything from anywhere versus just like blockchain to blockchain. So um, yeah, there's there's just, this is the only any to any interoperability solution in the world. And that includes blockchains, distributed ledgers, legacy financial systems, and any database really. Thank you very much. I can send a, there's that. depending on how deep you want to go, I'm going to link in the chat a video that helped me understand these differences. Um, it was the chief or the head of innovation at Quant Network did a presentation on Hyperledger's YouTube channel. So I just linked that right there. And this will give you a breakdown um, of these different types of interoperability uh, from a more technical level, depending on how deep you want to go. Wow. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we are six minutes over time, seven now. Um, we just want to say something. Go ahead, Brian. 
Um, yeah, actually, uh, Greg, if there's people who want to know more about uh, Quant or have questions for you, how can they best contact you or where can they find more information about you and the things that you do? Thank you. Um, so I just started using Twitter a lot the last like month or not even. Um, I've had Twitter for a long time, but I never really used it. And now I'm putting out all this Quant content and like the community is eating it up. So I'm like, I have like 500 followers, but I'm getting like... 30, 40 retweets, and like hundreds of likes. So I'm like, damn, because the telegram groups are crazy and everyone's like rabid because they understand what's happening here. So I'm really enjoying Twitter. Uh, if you want to follow me at Greg Lunt 27, that is my Twitter handle, G-R-E-G-L-U-N-T 27. And then uh, I do a lot of presentations uh, for around quant with uh, updates. There's a lot going on. I just did one yesterday. Um, that's our, and those are live at greglunt.club in your browser. And uh, there are links in, the, it's a, basically it's a link tree and there's one link at the top that says previous recordings. And those will be all my recordings. Um, but on Twitter, I'll be announcing kind of when the new rooms are and things of that nature. So uh, I put a lot of effort into those. They're very polished. Um, this was this, I know this felt a little rushed. Um, these are, these ones I don't really put a cap on and, and they go for a few hours sometimes, but um, I find them, you know, people find them pretty valuable. So I would check those out. Uh, more generally speaking, if you're into Telegram, there's a bunch of quant, uh, Telegram channels um, that I can link you to and I'll have up on my link tree. And yeah, there's other stuff, but I think that's a good place to start. Mm. Awesome. Yeah, oh. I just put the links in the chat as well. Oh, yeah, you can. This is a community run, um, basically, resource hub. It's called Quantpedia, oh, and good. it has a ton of information on there. You'll get lost in there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think, yeah, as a first pointer, uh, I would say to people go to the link tree. I put it in the chat. And from there onwards, they can sign up to kind of get updates from you. And um, awesome. It's great to know that, that your, your content is is uh doing so well and like it's uh yeah it's growing now so it's good to see yeah and thank you guys for the opportunity to come speak again it's always fun yeah no and like uh Ethan said we're eventually gonna bring you to the academy for those who are here these are our free um every week uh, we have a free talk which is this one we also have an academy if you want to get uh, deeper and more educated in terms of crypto you can also contact us and find out more about our academy. If this is your first time in this uh, crypto talk and that goes for Brooks and I think Brian, you're gonna be receiving um, an email where you're gonna book a, a call one-on-one -on -one with me and we're gonna be have a chat and find out how can I best serve you on your journey. Awesome. And we hope to bring Greg back to the academy as well uh, as some other events that we have, he's very knowledgeable. and. Thank you guys for being here. If you guys like this, we're going to be bringing more experts in different fields into this uh, space. If you guys want to see more of that, just let us know on the Facebook group and we're going to bring more people. Greg, thank you once again, man. <laughs> Wonderful. Always a pleasure, man. Thank you for having me. Bye. Thank you so much, Greg. See you next time. Thank you, see guys. You everyone. Great questions. I saw. Yeah. See you. See you guys. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.